Welcome to Esoteric Thoughts. Today I have the privilege of welcoming Dr. Dennis MacDonald to the channel. And Dr. MacDonald is going to be talking to us about Homer and the Gospels and the correlation between the two and the sources of the stories within the Gospel of Mark. So Dr. MacDonald, how are you? Dr. MacDonald? Oh, 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 no, I didn't know that that, that was a question. No, I'm fine. Thank you, Esther Tarek. It's, it's fine. a it's pleasure fine. to meet you. And we had a good chat just now getting acquainted. Um, so so could you could you start off by just by talking through uh, your your work, your research, before we actually get stuck into the actual books? If you can talk to us about your work and your research. Well, I was... Um, raised as a conservative Baptist pastor's kid, I went to Bob Jones University, which was a fundamentalist college in the United States. Um, and I had an awakening because of the death of Martin Luther King Jr. Everybody that I knew at that university applauded his death. Um, as though it was an almost divine judgment on him. And I said, th that kind of racism is not going to be a part of my religious experience. So um, I took a job as a youth pastor in a Baptist church in California um, and uh, am a musician. So I was able to lead the choir and so on. But during that year, I translated the entire Greek New Testament for myself. I had taken lots of Greek and Latin in the past and enjoyed that and realized that the New Testament had a moral horizon that had nothing to do with the fundamentalism that I had uh, been had grown up with. And my parents were um, really quite enlightened on issues of race, but that was not true of the fundamentalism in the South where I had been. And so I helped start a magazine called the Sojourner Magazine, which is a evangelical, uh, evangelically oriented, but uh, social justice intoxicated um, magazine, and realized that if religion was going to um, make a difference in the American situation, it would have to be more liberating than the uh, religion that I had seen. Um, I was, because I was good at languages, I um, had a, a, a full scholarship to Harvard for a PhD in New Testament. But when I went there, I spent most of my classes in classics, and especially in Greek philosophy. And uh, that became really important as a way of understanding the New Testament to, to connect it to classical antiquity. But during that time, I was not exposed to very much Greek poetry, the Homeric epics or the Greek tragedies and so on. And um, um, I was especially interested in Jewish, or sorry, Christian apocryphal writings, apocryphal acts of apostles, apocryphal gospels, you know, the marginal texts in the Christian tradition. <clears throat> and I had a job at a Methodist seminary and was um, curious about um, a document called the Acts of Andrew, which almost nobody has heard of, but it's really a fantastic document. And while I was working, I realized that the author was consistently imitating the uh, Homeric epics and Athenian tragedy. Now, let me say something about Homer that maybe your viewers don't know about. The Homeric epics were written in archaic Greek um, in the middle of the uh, 7th century BCE. And that is um, more than a century earlier than the composition of the Gospels and any Christian text. But they became extremely important in Greek education and Greek identity. So that even at the, uh, in the fourth century of the common era, a thousand years later, 
people learned to read Greek primarily by exposure to the Homeric epics. And that largely it was because not just that the epics are wonderful literature, but they became the foundation literature of Greek identity, even in the Roman Empire. So almost everyone knew um, the Homeric epics. Let me, esoteric, let me give you uh, some data. Between the years 200 BCE and 200 AD, or CE in the common era, um, we have 800 fragments of the Homeric epics. We have five of the Greek Bible, five against 800. There was no text more commonly available in antiquity than some book of the 48 books of the Homeric epics. It was everywhere and people would cite the Homeric epics on the street. <clears throat> we have um, just massive evidence of imitation of these texts by Jews before the writing of the New Testament, but then also in the New Testament. Now, I at first didn't think there was any Homeric imitation in the New Testament. I just saw it in the Acts of Andrew. So for example, um, Andrew is uh, tied to his cross at the edge of the sea, and he understands it to be um, like the mast of Odysseus while he's sailing past desires to get back to his spiritual home. <clears throat> Many of your readers will know about Odysseus at the mast in, in Greek mythology. But the, um, the, the parallels went on and on and on. In um, 19... 84, I was reading the Gospel of Mark in Greek, preparing for a class, and I was astonished how many parallels there were between Mark and the Homeric epics. The Jewish leaders were like Penelope's suitors. Jesus sails the sea with incompetent and income poop, uh, disciples that can't suffer the way he does. Um, he is anointed for his death, very much like Odysseus being anointed by Eurycleia um, in a recognition scene. Jesus um, um, encounters a caveman like Polyphemus, but instead of stealing his cattle, he uh, restores his sanity. And the parallels went on and on esoteric. I couldn't believe it. Now, I gave my old lecture notes to my students because I thought this stuff is going to be considered heretical and unwelcome, and I needed to digest it. But um, I did digest it and found it not only in the Gospel of Mark, but in Luke and the Acts of the Apostles and other Christian Apocrypha. It's almost everywhere. Now, it's not everywhere, but it is really so pervasive. And to my knowledge, Nobody before me had suggested that you have these texts uh, engaging in the Homeric epics and Athenian tragedy, especially Euripides Bacchae, but other texts too. And this is still the case in my own discipline. New Testament scholars are tone deaf to the Homeric epics. And I know why, because of the history of the discipline and its in, its. Uh, engagement with Christian theology and so on. But um, so my books, um, and there are a dozen of them out there now, and another one that's coming, which is reference work, document how these texts get used. Now, it's not plagiarism. It's not um, hidden. It's actually advertised by means of, of cognate words and um, so on. And these authors are interested in transforming Greek religion by the Christian message to show that Jesus is more compassionate than the likes of Achilles and, and Hector um, and is a donor deity, much like Dionysus is in providing wine and eternal life to um, its informants. And it has been a joy ride, esoterica, um, it, it, or esoteric. It's, it's just been a, a, a thrilling intellectual enterprise for me. And I hope that you know, we can talk about it a little more.
any comments or question or yeah so uh, you touched on the reason why there's still scholarly resistance even though the way that you outlay the comparisons in the book uh, are very very clear for people to see obviously there are some cases where the the case is a lot stronger in on some stories than in others but that's that's true yeah some are weaker yeah yes but there's still i still I'm a bit baffled as to why there's still that level of resistance. So in looking at some of the uh, scholarly criticism out there, I still, even, even in reading the criticism, I still am a bit confused as they're not being very clear as to exactly what issue they have. From your perspective, can you just expand a bit more on the reasoning for the resistance? Um, I think some of it's scholarly jealousy because esoteric, if this stuff is right, almost everything written on the Gospels is wrong. So, you know, I'm stepping on a lot of toes, and I don't mean to step on toes. I learn a lot from other scholars. I wish they would learn something from me uh, in return. But um, scientific revolutions are characterized by the following. You have um, disciplines that have their own agendas, they have their own research traditions. They, um, in, in the case of New Testament scholarship, that tradition often is theological and Christian and not humanistic. And the idea that, uh, and then certainly the Christian movement emerges out of Judaism and the most obvious intertexts in the Gospels are Jewish scriptures, and they're cited, they're imitated, and so on. So the discipline has been attentive to um, the Jewish backgrounds of the New Testament and not to um, classical Greek poetry. So for example, the critical edition of the New Testament that is most commonly used by scholars Nestle 28, lists for Jewish texts thousands of allusions and citations and so on in the New Testament. It lists five for classical Greek literature. Homer is entirely missing. There are only two that are poets. Um, one quotation from Euripides Bacchae is the only one that comes from Athenian tragedy. And that has to be an oversight. That has to be culturally blind to things that are not Jewish in the New Testament. And it's inexcusable. The Anchor Bible Dictionary, a wonderful reference work, six volumes, has no ref, no, uh, uh, nothing on Greek poetry. There's no reference to Homer. There's no reference to Euripides. There's not even a reference to Virgil's Aeneid, which was the most important document in the Roman Empire for giving an identity. So there is a reference on Homer, but it's not the Homer the poet. It's a unit of measure for wheat. So a unit of measure for wheat gets a... a, a, a a line in Homer, the most important poet of antiquity, that gets nothing. I mean, we're talking about systematic myopia that's caused by, um, now I'm not against Jewish parallels. I'm not against all the citations and allusions that you find in Nestle 28. I mean, they're there, but um, give me a break. So um, when I was at Harvard, for example, uh, even in the classics department, I was exposed very little to Homer. Later on, I became friends with probably one of the, the greatest Homeric scholars ever that ever lived, Albert uh, Lord. And he encouraged me in this way um, uh, you know, to pursue this. And it's just been a gold mine um, of information. 
Now, the reason that the church doesn't understand these things, I mean, uh, uh, so that's the scholarly answer. They, but the church doesn't understand them because probably like most of your viewers esoteric, they don't know Homer, except for Homer Simpson. Um, so that the, whole, the, the idea that classical Greek poetry that was written over a century before the Gospels would have anything relevant uh, to the Gospels or the New Testament seems outrageous. Um, and so the, these classical texts are invisible. But as Hegel said, um, Homer is the oxygen that Greeks breathed. It was everywhere in the culture. It gave identity. It helped establish what ethics are going to be important in the Greco-Roman world. And so much so that Virgil, to uh, give a foundational epic for the Roman Empire, found it congenial to rewrite the Homeric epics in the Aeneid. Ovid does something of the same thing in Latin and the Metamorphoses in order to say that um, here are Greek examples, the Roman examples are better, and our Aeneas as the founder of, an, uh, of our empire is more virtuous than um, Ulysses, and, but as courageous as, um, um, as Hector or Achilles. So um, it, it's the invisible for the average person, it's the invisibility of Greek poetry that's the problem. For scholars, it's the inertia of the, uh, the discipline and the limitation of our uh, reference works. Can we go through a couple of examples where we can actually see the comparisons between the uh, homoerotics and the Gospels? Sure. Oh, are you asking me to give one? Yes, yes. Oh, I see. Um, well, let's do um, the Gerasene demoniac. Okay. And in um, mythologizing Jesus, uh -huh. um, it would be uh, chapter five or page 37. Actually, page 42, I think. Okay. Okay, I'm going to read the left-hand column, Esoteric, okay? And you're going to read the one for Mark 5, 1 to 10. Okay. You see where we are? Yes. Okay. Odysseus and his crew sailed to the land of the Cyclopes, and then later the land of Circe. Jesus and his disciples, disciples sailed to the region of the Gerasenes. On the mountains of the Cyclopes, countless goats grazed, and Circe turned Odysseus's comrades into swine. On the mountains, a large herd of swine grazed, about 2,000 of them. Odysseus and crew of 12 men, by the way, went to uh, went ashore. Jesus and his disciples went ashore. They discovered a savage, lawless giant who lived in a cave. They discovered a savage, lawless, demon-possessed man who lived among the caves. Polyphemus usually was depicted nude in ancient art. The savage was nude. Circe recognized Odysseus and asked him not to harm her, uh, and that's for Circe, and the giant Polyphemus asked Odysseus if he had come to harm him. The savage recognized Jesus and asked him not to harm him. The giant asked Odysseus his name. Jesus asked the monster his name. Odysseus answered, nobody, Utus. The savage answered, Legion. Odysseus subdued the giant with violence and trickery, and Circe had turned Odysseus's soldiers into swine. Jesus subdued the demons with a word and sent them into the swine 
and then into the lake. The shepherd called out to his neighbors. The swine herds reported to their neighbors. The Cyclopes came to the site asking about Polyphemus' sheep and goats. The neighbors came to the site to find out about their swine. Odysseus and crew boarded ship. Jesus and his disciples boarded ship. Odysseus told the giant to broadcast that he had blinded him. Jesus told the healed monster to broadcast what God had done for him. The giant asked Odysseus, now on ship, to come back. The savage asked Jesus, now on ship, if he could be with him. Odysseus refused the request. Jesus refused the request. Odysseus and his crew sailed away. Jesus and his disciples sailed away. Odysseus awoke during a storm in the episode immediately following Polyphemus. Jesus awoke during a storm and calmed the wind and sea immediately before the savage. Now, let me continue reading, if I might. Byzantine poets clearly recognized such similarities between these tales, for when they retold the story of the demoniac, they used Odyssey 9 to do so. So here's what we find. Now, these are Christian Byzantine authors. Um, and in this case, maybe the 6th century, um, who retell the story of the Gerasene demoniac. But when Jesus and the disciples arrived at the area located among the Gerasenes, here there was a headland where a cave lay next to the sea, with cascading laurel as though encircling it, in it, swine and goats rested at night around in a high tomb. These are lines directly from the Odyssey. Um, and that was built with large lone stones set deep in the earth with tall pines and high foliaged oaks. There slept a monstrous man <clears throat> whom a demon shepherded by itself by far away. He did not engage with others, but lived apart and knew only cruel thoughts. For he had been <clears throat> made into a monstrosity and was not like a man who eats bread, but like a wooded peak of high mountains that looms larger than the rest. Those lines are sequential from the Odyssey. These people saw similarities between the biblical story and Homeric epics. Mark wanted his readers to note that Jesus was better and more powerful a uh, hero than Homer's. Whereas Odysseus blinded a monster, Jesus made a monster sane. Similarly, Circe turned soldiers into swine for eating, but Jesus cast the legion of demons into swine to return the madman to sanity. Here again, Jesus is a hero of compassion. So uh, it is hard to explain those parallels, esoteric, unless you say there's some kind of clever, artistic, Remythologizing going on. Now, in my judgment, um, Jesus was regarded as an as a, an exorcist. So this isn't asking a question about whether Jesus existed or whether he was an exorcist, <clears throat> but this elaborate elaboration on an exorcism surely evokes the Homeric epics, and we saw that these Byzantine poets recognized it and used these lines to introduce the, uh, the uh, healing of the uh, Gerasen. And uh, so this is just one example of scores of them in the New Testament. This is not a one-off. Can we look at one more example? Sure. You mentioned that maybe doing the anointing woman. Sure. Okay. So uh, that one is going to be um, chapter 15 or around page 90. And actually the, the, um, 
uh, esoteric. Let's look at page 94. <clears throat> Okay, 94, got it. Okay, Odyssey 19 is called the Niptra. This is where Odysseus is recognized by his nurse, Eurycleia, when she um, uh, anoints him, uh, washes his feet. Telemachus, now Telemachus is Odysseus's son. Telemachus was amazed at the great light that shone on the walls of his house. One of Jesus' disciples was, was amazed at the great buildings in the Jerusalem temple. Odysseus went to Penelope and sat. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, Olives and sat. Penelope in private questioned her husband in disguise. Four of the disciples in private asked him about the destruction of the temple. Odysseus answered and gave her signs that he had seen her husband and that he would soon return. Jesus answered and gave them the sign he would return. That very day, Odysseus was consulting the oak sacred to Zeus at Dodona, according to his own report. The disciples should consult the fig tree. He is near. He is near. All these things will come to pass. Until all these things take place. No one in Ithaca knew if or when Odysseus would return. It is like a man on a journey. Keep watch, because you do not know when the Lord of the house is coming. The suitors were prepared to kill Telemachus and Odysseus. The chief priests and scribes were seeking some deceitful way to arrest and kill. The suitors feared harming uh, harm from the people of Ithaca. The authorities feared a popular uprising. After giving his prophecies to Penelope, Odysseus, disguised as a beggar, sat by himself. After giving these prophecies to four disciples, Jesus sat at, at table in the humble home of a leper. Eurycleia came in with a bowl of water and washed his feet. Later, she, quote, anointed him generously with oil, end quote. A woman came with an expensive stone jar of ointment and poured the contents on Jesus's head. When she recognized her master, she dropped his leg into the brass vessel, spilling the water. She broke the jar to release the oil. She alone recognized her king. She alone recognized that Jesus soon would die. Melantho, uh, a, a female um, slave, had objected to Penelope's generosity to a poor beggar. People at the meal objected to the woman's extravagant anointing. The, the ointment could have been sold and the money given to the poor. Odysseus and Eurycleia discussed the disloyalty of some of the slaves. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest for the purpose of betraying him. I've delayed the most striking and unusual similarity until now. Jesus praised the woman by saying, wherever the good news is proclaimed throughout the world, what this woman has done will be mentioned in her memory. That is, the woman will have far-flung renown. The... Um, um, she will be Eurycleia, renowned far and wide. The significance of the name Eurycleia was noted by an ancient reader. Eurycleia, she who had far flung and great fame. So that, um, and the, again, the Byzantine readers of the text of Jesus's anointing used lines from this very story in the Odyssey to retell it, and they emphasize the, that the name Eurycleia means renowned far and wide. And it said of the woman who anointed Jesus that wherever the gospel is preached, she will be remembered. 
So these similarities uh, don't go away and you can't, you have to explain them somehow esoteric. Now, maybe I didn't correctly understand it. It could be that these stories are simply in the air and that they know folklore like this, but it doesn't account for all the, the whole sequence of similarities. Um, the, the, it's really quite unusual and it requires an explanation. If we can just go back a bit, while you were doing your your research, and you and you discovered this, what does what did this research? How did this impact you in terms of what you believed at the time prior to discovering the, and making the correlations? My time at Harvard was extremely important for me to be exposed to classical literature uh, in Greek and Latin. And it made me more of a humanist. And um, I, uh, I would say a humanist and a theoskeptic. That is, uh, I'm skeptical about any language about a God. So I'm an atheist who's not against religion. In fact, I find religion to be really a wonderful human product. It's not revealed by God. The Bible is not the word of God. It's a collection of, of, of tales um, that people wrote in a way of trying to imagine what their God would want and, uh, and would approve of. So uh, I'm a theoskeptic, but there, I'm also a musician. So uh, I think there's good music and bad music. And when I play in a group, I just hope I make the music more beautiful. The same thing's true for uh, religion. Religion is a wonderful creative human product. And it encourages morality and art and music and, um, and a good life. And your own experience as a, a Seventh-day Adventist, which you told me about earlier on, um, is an example where the Seventh-day Adventists have done so much good in the world, and yet without really understanding where the uh, ethical power of the New Testament derives in, in a, a human engagement with uh, Greek culture is a way to say that their hero is more virtuous and more compassionate and more powerful than the Greek deities. So um, I now am a, I would, I call myself a humanist theoskeptic who um, devoted his career to making Christian ministers more aware and more humble about what's going on in these gospels and to give background um, in uh, especially uh, Greek poetry and philosophy. So that's where I am. Now, by the way, I'm not trying to encourage anyone to leave uh, Christianity or <laughs> Judaism or Buddhism or Islam. Uh, I'm, it's fine with me. Make it beautiful though. Make it compassionate. Make uh, be humble enough to understand that it's a human product. That um, you, as whatever your uh, religious background, uh, finds attractive, and make it more beautiful. How would you explain why the Gospels and the and even the non-canonical books, uh, in terms of how they retell? the same stories very differently. There are inconsistencies right the way through the gospels and the non-canonical books. What's the reason for that? I think it's the uh, human creative process that um, one reads these texts uh, and finds them in some way um, um, ineffective or um, uh, problematic and you try to make it better. And so I think the entire gospel enterprise of, um, let's say, Matthew and Luke rewriting Mark, for example, or even the Q document, which we haven't talked about, but it's surely something is there. 
in these uh, apocryphal gospels, at each stage, we have examples of human creativity and literary art used to, in the position of the authors, make improvements and to make them more congenial to altering um, social contexts. So one way to read these texts is to understand what's going on historically for these communities. Why do they, uh, are they attracted to some gospel stories or sayings and not to others? And um, what's to be gained for, from them about um, making these revisions? So it's not, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a creative and wonderful uh, literary tradition. And in terms of your books, in what order would you recommend readers who are new to your work? What order would you advise that they start reading your, your books? I think the most accessible one, and fortunately the one that's cheapest and is available uh, digitally, is Mythologizing Jesus. And that's the one we've been reading from, Mesoteric. Um, if one wants to delve deeper into that, um, I think the Gospels and Homer is um, a good place to go. If one is interested in the Gospel of John, my book, The Dionysian Gospel, is uh, really quite accessible and uh, has, has turned out to be quite popular. If one's interested in um, Luke Acts, I think the Homer, um, uh, Luke and Virgil is a, a good starting place. But I also am working on a two volume um, mimesis, it's called Synopses of Epic Tragedy and the Gospels. It's a reference work set up as a synoptic, um, as a synopsis of the Gospels that includes extensive imitations of uh, Greek poetry with my own translations of Homer or Euripides or whatever. And there's nothing like it esoteric ever been written even close to it um, as a reference work. My other work is uh, analytical and it's uh, you know thematic, but this is a way of people who are interested like yourself to say, I want to know more about the Gerasene demoniac. And you turn in the synopsis and I give the, the, the versions of it in Mark, Matthew, and Luke in parallel columns with an extensive excursus on the Gerasene, uh, on uh, Polyphemus and Circe. So um, it's, and it's a reference work esoteric because I want people to make their own assessments of how these things relate to each other. And this has no analogy in any language for 2,000 years. We are so overdue for a, a rethinking of these texts against their literary cultural background. Um, and so I'm really excited about it. Actually, the book ought to be out in hardback this fall. And within a, probably after a year, after the sales, uh, it'll be available as a PDF. And I would like to have a copy of it in the hands of everyone who teaches Sunday school, to be honest with you, and in seminaries. It, you don't have to agree with it. It's not, a, it's not, the issue isn't agreeing. The issue is being enlightened. Yes, this is another way of understanding these texts. And by the way, I've been so encouraged by people like yourself and probably uh, many of your viewers that they're turned off with religion, um, organized religion, but they're fascinated intellectually with these challenges and with the moral horizon of these texts and the wisdom that's contained in them. And we don't want to lose track. We don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater to be really quite trite. Um, the, the, the Bible generally, but the Gospels, in my view, in particular, are treasures of human creativity and morality. And we don't want to get rid of them. We just want to understand them and understand their diversity. And they're not saying exactly the same things. And they're struggling as we are to make sense of the world. Dr. McDonald, 
thank you for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. All the best to you and your viewers. <laughs>